Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be doing a brief overview of the book of Job in our continuing study of the poetic books of the Old Testament. Way back in, I think it was in the 1980s, maybe even earlier than that, uh, a rabbi by the name of Harold Kushner uh, wrote a book um, on the subject of theodicy. Theodicy is just a Greek word meaning uh, the righteousness of God, entitled Why, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And, and to be fair, he was writing this uh, after experiencing deep losses. His son had died, uh, and, and I get that. Uh, but he asked the question, how can a good God allow bad things like that to happen? And, and he, he said, well, there's one or two possibilities. Either God isn't good, God's all-powerful, but he's not, not good, uh, and, and so therefore just expect bad things to happen. Or else God is good, and he's doing the best that he can, but he's sort of overworked, underpaid, uh, and, and this is just the best he's able to do. And so this was his question, if God is good, and if God is all-powerful, then why does evil exist? Now, I, I think there's a, a third conclusion, and that's the one that we're going to find in the book of Job. So my, my heart goes out to Rabbi Kushner, but I think he was wrong in his conclusion. The book of Job is going to deal with this problem of pain. Now, the book begins with a prologue in the first two chapters. There's a historical prologue, and we're going to look at this uh, next time uh, of how, how Job is tested, and all these bad things take place uh, in Job's life, and, and we'll see that in depth. Um, and the book's going to end with the finishing the story where, where Job is going to be restored. So it starts off with all the bad things that take place in Job's life. At the end, in chapter 42, we're going to see all the, the good things, you know, the, the bad things are overturned, uh, and, and how good things take place. And in the middle of the book, he, Job's three friends show up and enter into a series of dialogues and discourses with them. Uh, we find out there's a, a fourth friend uh, by the name of Elihu, and, and he has some things to say. And then in chapter 38, God shows up. And when God shows up, everybody else just gets quiet and listens. And that's going to be sort of the, the climactic part of the book. And, and really, the epilogue is almost anticlimactic. Because when God shows up, that's, the, that's really the climactic part of the book. Now, that means that chapters 1 and 2 and chapter 42 are the prose section of the book. Remember, this is a, a study in, uh, on the poetry of the Old Testament. It's chapters 3 through 41 that, that are po the poetic sections. Um, so chapters 1 and 2, chapter 42, the, it's very plain language, just it's easy Hebrew, it's, it's small words, easy to read. In, in the poetry section, poetry is just like that. It's much more ornate. Uh, why say it in one word when you can use three? Uh, and so th it's very ornate language. Now I am told, and I'm not an expert in Chaldean, but uh, chapters 1 and 2 and chapter 42 are written in pure Hebrew, and, and I would say even fairly simple Hebrew. Uh, what I'm told is that chapters 3 through 41, the poetic section, contain many expressions that are characteristic of Chaldean. And if that's true, then that might be pointing to a, a date for the composition of this book. We don't know when the story took place, but, but as to when it's written, it might be written sometime uh, after the days of King David and, and all the way up to maybe the time of, of Babylon uh, or, or beyond, um, because that's when you have the Chaldeans. So if, if that's true, that these expressions are drawn from someone who's acquainted with Chaldean. 